for another episode of Pink Careers webinar show. I'm so excited today to be joined by Angela Howard. And in a second, I will introduce her. Um, as you guys have started to come in, I will also just quickly make sure that we are live on LinkedIn because that's the that's the other thing that we've started to do. So I guess, I guess there's a little bit like of a lag there. <laughs> uh, but as you guys are rolling in, please let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, if this is the first time that you have joined us, I already see a few names that um, that have been with us before. So Larismar had joined us um, for some some earlier webinars as well. Welcome again, and uh, others also. Please let us know where you're joining us from, and also what is one thing that you would like to learn from the webinar today. So we make sure that we cover that as either a question or during our conversation. Uh, do let us know what is one thing that you would like to learn from the webinar today. Uh, so as um, people are joining us, let us let me give uh, you a quick introduction of the topic today, and then we'll go into introducing our guest. And uh, we have some amazing questions that we have, and some hard questions that we have lined up for today uh, <laughs> to really help you step up from that individual contributor to the manager role. Uh, but a quick introduction about Pink Careers in case you are joining us for the very first time. Uh, my name is Richa Bansal. I'm the founder and CEO of Pink Careers. And my personal mission is to close the gender gap in the C-suite. And we do that by bringing very straightforward advice and leadership coaching to early professional women. Um, <clears throat> the topic here that we are talking about today is about how to level up from individual contributor to manager. So for many of us, the way it traditionally works is that you are excellent at your job, you do so well as an individual contributor, and boom, you get promoted to a manager. No training, no nothing. It's assumed that if you are great at an individual contributor role, you would be great at a manager role as well. But that doesn't always happen. It is very necessary to gain the skills. What we term as soft skills really shouldn't be called soft skills anymore. Those are the essential skills, even more important than hard skills, uh, that we must gain if we want to really level up and be effective in our roles as a manager. So in today's topic, in today's discussion, we are going to cover um, all the details right from how do you recognize that you are ready for that uh, people manager role? How do you have that conversation with your manager if you think you're ready? And then how do you set yourself up so that you can succeed in that role? Those are all the topics that we will cover in our discussion today. So I'm also, again, quickly checking if we are going live on LinkedIn now. And I can see that we are, so that's great. I have a team member who is monitoring chat uh, for LinkedIn Live as well. So if any of you who is joining us on the live, feel free to put your questions in the comment in the comment section as well. And she would be able to bring it up here and we would be able to cover it. Um, the other item on the agenda is to be a little bit familiar with the systems that we have here. So as you are listening in to the fireside chat, if you have any questions that come to your mind, make sure that you put them in this box that you see called ask a question. When you put your questions in the ask a question box, what it allows us to do is to mark when we start answering that question. So anybody, any of your colleagues who are watching the event um, after the fact on demand, then they are able to play the response to that question from, the, from that uh, timestamp. And it just allows them to get answers to the questions if they have the same, same one as well. All right, that's all the housekeeping items. Again, as you are rolling in, let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, we see two of you have joined us from Houston. Hi, and uh, would love to know uh, from others as well. All right, so let me introduce now to our very lovely guest here. So Angela Howard, she has spent over a decade working with individuals and now organizations ranging from 120 employees to over 300,000 employees to accelerate businesses by helping their people thrive. Uh, she's dedicated to shaping the workforce of tomorrow, um, which is grounded in building human-centric workplaces, better leaders, and thriving communities. She's a trusted advisor and coach to owners, founders, and CEOs interested in shaping and actualizing their organizational culture for the collective good of the organization, employees, and communities. And in fact, she's on a personal mission to reinvent the role of HR and create more human-centric workplaces that not only enrich the lives um, and businesses um, of these organizations, but essentially enriches the lives of the diverse workforce uh, and bring greater good to the, to the world. She has received her MA in organizational psychology 
a specialized field focused on rigor and research around behavior and human potential in the workplace. With that, I would like to give a very warm welcome to Angela. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Excited for our conversation today. It's a great topic. <laughs> yeah. So let's start with uh, defining what, what leadership is for you. Hmm. So yeah, leadership is influence. It is a positive influence on others and your ability to get work done uh, through others and through their purpose as well. So at its very simplest, um, I guess, definition, that's that's how I would define leadership. Yeah, I think leadership, when people hear about the term leadership, they automatically think that you have to have reportees uh, mm. into you. you need to have uh, people reporting into you. I really separate out leadership from people managers, right? Because Brené Brown said in her book, Dare to Lead, that leadership essentially ownership. You know, if you are taking ownership of uh, bettering the processes and the people around you, then you are mm. leader. And that kind of resonates with what you're saying, right? Um, leadership is about influence. Whether you have direct reports or not, we have to influence people and processes um, and our stakeholders around us all the time. Yeah, and I think leadership, you know, transcends, you know, the workplace, our personal lives, you know, our our friend groups. I mean, leadership is, I, I see it as more of a mentality, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Versus a, you know, a, a level on, a, on an org chart. Um, and it permeates through different facets in our lives too. Absolutely. So can you share maybe a few examples of how we can be leaders, even if we are not a leader on the org chart per se? So like when you talked about the leadership mentality, what exactly is the leadership mentality? And uh, maybe some examples of that. Yeah. So, you know, leadership, having a leadership mentality is taking a responsibility for having a positive impact on other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's also about your influence in motivating others and whether that's your children at home or your team at work. And so, you know, I really, I really equate it to something called intrapreneurship. So mm -hmm. we, we know about entrepreneurship, you act, you have your own business, right? But yeah. as an intrapreneur, you're taking a leadership role in ownership of a process, of a program, of your scope, your sphere of influence. And so a good example is thinking about what do I have influence on here and where do I need to gain influence from other people and how can I create spaces where people can share and voice their opinions and then take those things into consideration to move something forward. So that is a leadership skill is working across groups, different personalities and being empathetic to people's needs. Okay. What are some of the other skills that leaders have? You know, again, leaders who are not necessarily people managers have. I think just general empathy, understanding other people's, the seat of other people and where they're coming from mm -hmm. and setting your own perspective and bias aside. So that's a very, it's a tough skill to kind of take yourself out of your experience and your background and put yourself into another person's shoes and then be able to explore that and, and come to some common ground. So that goes back to the influence, but it also goes back to self-awareness. Mm -hmm. It goes to understanding your biases and um, having empathy for other people. So um, are the skills that uh, we need as somebody who's a, who could be considered a leader because they have empathy, they are developing these skills to influence others or they are in roles where they're influencing others, are these skills that are required for being a leader different from the skills that are required for being people manager? Or maybe there are some additional skills required to be people managers. Yeah, so people managers, I think there are some additional skills that you need, right? You need to understand how to facilitate ideas into action. Oftentimes, if you're a people manager, you are the final buck. You have the final decision. And so um, having to collate all those ideas and all that empathy for other people, but then making a decision at the end and living with that decision and managing that decision. Um, I think also simple, I'll call it facilitative leader skills, like, um, you know, how often do you meet with your team? How to have a performance conversation? These are kind of tactical skills mm -hmm. um, that leaders need to be able to facilitate teams to success. Okay, so in some sense, being a people manager is a little bit more difficult than being a leader. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, I think because you need you need the skills of the leadership, you know, what a leader needs, yeah. but then you also need some additional skills, which yes. later on facilitating a movement 
right? In, yes. in your projects and processes that you are managing. Yes. So you could be a people leader. Uh, to be a people leader, you must also be, to be a people manager, you must also be a leader, but you right. don't need to be a people manager to be a leader. <laughs> so, yeah, I totally agree I've actually you. never really thought about it that way. You know, you always kind of very much separate these two roles that you're either a leader and you always have to be a leader and then people manager somehow easier. But now that I'm talking to you, I'm realizing it's not really, it's actually mm -hmm. the reverse. People manager actually requires a little bit more skills and it's a, uh, being a leader essentially becomes a subset of being people manager. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great point. I think we came to a good epiphany there during the <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of our audience here is, is with us today because they are either stepped into their first people manager roles mm -hmm. or they're looking to step into those roles um, and really grow up the org chart. And so how does somebody know that they are ready now to move from being a leader and perhaps they're already getting these skills around empathy and these skills around influencing others. So, and they are now ready to step into roles where they are now leading teams. How can somebody know that they are ready? It's a great question. So I think the first piece is your acceptance around the people management leadership journey, because once you, once you acquire a team, Mm -hmm. uh, you are going to be working with people who are different than you. So I think um, kind of checking your ego a little bit and understanding your um, tolerance for feedback. <laughs> so if you have a high tolerance and you're very accepting of feedback, that's a really good indicator that you're ready for a people management role. Because your team is going to, if you've created a psychologically safe space, Mm -hmm. Your team's going to give you feedback. They're going to tell you what's going right and what's going wrong. And that's the type of leadership we need in people management. I think the other thing is also uh, your ability to think strategically, but also humble enough to learn the work and to get in there and get your hands dirty so you can coach your team. So this is, you know, some people call it player coach uh, type of role where you need to be able to coach and lead, but also get in there and learn and figure out how to do things differently. So humble, being humble, having humility is also a good indicator that you're ready for a people management role. And then I think just the, the mere responsibility, think about the responsibility you have as a people manager, mm -hmm. your actions, your behaviors impact these people, right? They go home and they either sit at the dinner table with their family and they say, oh, I've got the best boss in the world. They make my life so much easier. I'm doing my best work. Or you're the person who they're bad mouthing and you're causing them stress because of perhaps your style or, or something you've done that day. So the responsibility is huge, not just to that person, but to their family and their communities. And so if you're ready to take on that responsibility, then it's likely you're ready to be a people, people manager. So how do you actually judge and ask yourself these questions? Like I'm maybe go a little bit deeper into... If how, like, you know, I'm already taking responsibility, I welcome feedback, but I've been welcoming feedback from day one, let's say somebody, you know, thinks about it this way that I've been welcoming feedback from day one, I take responsibility, I do good work, I'm making a difference. But what is that switch that is happening? Or how can I make a deeper evaluation? How can I take a step back and really think about whether I'm ready for a people manager role? Ask others. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times we you know, we um, we tell ourselves a lot of stories in our head and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they're objective, sometimes they're not. Um, uh, so I would say ask others, you know, people you've worked with. Um, if it feels uncomfortable to ask, that's mm -hmm. okay. But being able to say, hey, you know, we've been working for uh, uh, with each other for a while. What feedback would you have for me? I wanna, I, I'm open, I'm open to all the feedback and collect that feedback. Mm -hmm. And use that as a tool to adjust and to make your strengthen your, your leadership and your people management capability. Um, so talking to other people. Yep. Uh, and I think also, if you have the means, um, finding yourself a coach. Mm -hmm. Because the, the journey to people management and leadership is ongoing, meaning you never arrive. Um, I mean, you, you could probably attest to this. It's not like one day we're like, oh, we're, we're, we're the best leaders in the world and we're doing everything right. I make mistakes daily, but I have the, I have the, the, the humility to say, okay, I did something wrong. I could have done that better. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what can I do differently next time? So 
just to kind of summarize, one, I think ask others, people you've worked with, people you've man, um, people who have managed you, your friends, your family, but then also, um, you know, take the opportunity to reflect on your leadership capability up until this point. Yeah, no, those are two great points. And I would also, um, I also, I always advise all the mentees that, that I have, um, it is very beneficial to keep a log of how you've been adding value to your organization so far, you know, keep like a weekly log or at the minimum, keep a monthly log that captures the work that you've been doing, but then also a step further from there, how that work has been making a difference. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that just, because I think that is important in, in this context because it allows you to go back and look at it, especially when you're thinking about, oh, am I ready to now step into, you know, ask for a promotion? Am I now ready to step into a people manager role? And you mm -hmm. suddenly get hit by this imposter syndrome. Then you can reflect back on all of the ways that you have added value to your team, to your organization. And then it allows you to, you know, uh, be more confident in asking and having that promotion conversation and, you know, feel ready, even though you may feel internally that you're not ready, but really understanding that you are indeed ready. Yes. So that, that's a great point. Imposter syndrome is, is real. And even again, even being in a position of leadership, I think uh, we also have it. So it's something that, um, you know, you need to get objective around, like you said, write things down, uh, talk about the impact you made, but also the results you achieved. And it's a kind of your own little hype, hype woman, right? <laughs> your, your yeah, mom, no, your diary. Like I, I did this workshop. Um, Google has this workshop called B, uh, uh, what is that called? Uh, somebody remind me if somebody remembers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so Google has this initiative called B something, which I'm completely losing right now. But essentially one of the exercises they have you do in that is to write down uh, all the ways in which you are awesome be awesome or something like, i'm completely butchering mm -hmm. the name but I, what they ask you to do is list down all the ways in which you're awesome in your personal life and professional life and the uh, the the facilitator that i did the workshop with she actually uh, was doing this exercise with every time mm -hmm. she was facilitating a class so not just a one and done event for her uh, and she was keeping all of these lists in a red box and so whenever she was down whenever she was hit by this imposter syndrome she would pick up you know the, her latest list from that red box and that allowed her to see all the ways in which she has added value and why she is now ready to take on increased responsibility or grow in her career, right? Mm -hmm. So just, uh, I know it's a little sidetrack, but I think it's important to touch upon the topic of imposter syndrome here because mm -hmm. women don't ask for that promotion until we feel we are 110% ready, right? Yeah. Whereas I really do think once you start getting comfortable in your role, that is the time to now ask for the promotion. Yes, I, I mean, research tells us just simply when women look at job descriptions, they want to check the box at 100% while your, you know, typical perhaps male leader says, you know what, I've got like 70% here, I'm gonna go for it. Even so, like 50%. <laughs> or 50%, right. So I will tell you in my own personal career, every single role I've taken on, I was not ready for. Like, <clears throat> for myself, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm not ready for this. There's a big chunk of this I don't know how to do. But you know what, I figured it out. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. You just figure it out on the job. In fact, you know, the, the, the problem of imposter syndrome never really goes away. Yesterday, I was speaking with um, with the CIO for the government of Canada. So mm. I got really fortunate to, to have a conversation with her. And she was saying, Richa, you know, imposter syndrome never goes away. She's mm -mm. the CIO for the government of Canada. Right. So anyways, uh, <laughs> a little sidetrack there. But um, my question for you now is, let's say you've done your due diligence, you've asked for feedback, you've been doing uh, the work you need to do to track your achievements and you feel mm -hmm. you're ready to have the promotion conversation now. Mm -hmm. How do you go about asking your manager that you are now ready for a promotion? Yeah, I think um, I think it, it, it needs to start off as a, so first of all, I think this can go many different ways depending on your relationship with your manager, right? Um, some of you are probably thinking, I don't have a great relationship with my manager. This seems intimidating for me to ask for a promotion, but some of you may be like, you know, we have open conversations about career all the time. I will, I would hope for all of you that it's the, the latter, um, but that's not the reality, right? Some folks um, perhaps don't have ongoing conversations about career development. So we have to take the initiative as the employee um, mm -hmm. to have the conversation. So 
first taking the initiative, having the conversation, I think the way it should go is um, understanding what that leader's feedback is about you. So if you haven't gotten feedback at this point, um, understand what their feedback is, but then presenting your side of things, right? Your that list of awesome accomplishments that you've that you've provided. Now, you know we we have some barriers to this, right? When it comes to you know, is the role available? Is this a role you're asking for that doesn't exist today? Um, but really, at the end of the day, if you can connect this to business outcomes, to say mm -hmm. I've been in this role for five years, there is a great opportunity for us to do more in this role. And I feel like I'm ready to take that on. And here is my plan. Here's what I, here's how that, that would, here's how that would be laid out from my perspective. And here's what I can do. And here's how much we can increase sales or increase, you know, uh, whatever metric you all are using in your department. So ma managing it to business outcomes, mm -hmm. if the role doesn't exist or if it exists, um, and then talking to your leader about if this isn't possible today, then what are what is the individual development plan for me to get there? Mm -hmm. So that's that's my at, at its best scenario. That's that's my recommendation. Um, you may get you know presented with some barriers to that, right? It's a it's a small company. We probably can't promote you within the next few years. And so at the end of the day, you have to bring it back to yourself. Like, what is your mission? What are what kind of experiences are you looking to obtain, and is this the place for you to play out those those talents? Yeah, I would also uh, add that uh, the very first step to to any of this conversation is ask yourself this question: Where do you want to be two years from now, five years from now, right, ten years mm -hmm. from now? Um, and then also thinking about um, how you're connecting the the promotion, the role that you're asking for, to what your two year goals are. Like, what are the skills that you want to gain? along the way to where you want to be in two years from now, right? And so sometimes also, which this also means that sometimes you have to be open about, as you were saying, perhaps this role doesn't exist or perhaps this role is not becoming available. So are there some other ancillary roles that uh, do exist that allow you to gain similar types of skills uh, without having the actual job title that you were aiming for? So that's something else to keep in mind as well. Yeah, so that's a great point, stretch opportunities, uh, you also have to be careful about making sure you're not adding out a ton of additional work without also getting compensated for that, right? Mm -hmm. So it is a balancing act of what are my career goals? What's my current role? What can I start to stretch myself in? And am I fairly compensated for that? Um, so that's another, that's probably another webinar <laughs> that we could talk about. So, but but so. maybe like talk about it a little bit, or maybe yeah. through an example or two, yeah. because I think that often happens. And in fact, I was speaking to a woman two weeks ago and she was exactly in the same role. You know, she was, um, she had a primary role and then she got this added responsibility of managing the DNI for their company. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and she was really passionate about DNI. She, she mm -hmm. was a, she was a coach on the side herself, but there was no additional compensation that came along with it. It's just added responsibility. So how do you have that conversation to make sure that you are getting compensated or, you know, you have a reduction in responsibilities in your first role so that you're able to manage both. So how would you go about having that conversation with your manager? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, what, what the, the word I think about is scope creep, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that can easily happen when you start just adding little things, especially if you're really passionate about it. You don't think about it as like, additional initial job, you see yourself benefiting from it. But I think that um, having a perspective into the market, um, doing some informal salary um, marketplace analysis, salary.com, LinkedIn, uh, to really say, okay, this was my role before. And if I'm adding this additional piece, is that is that a, a full time additional role? Is it just a, a little chunk of responsibility? Um, so doing some analysis yourself and and or you can actually ask the company to do a market analysis for your role as well. Um, you should feel empowered to, to ask that question and make sure you're paid um, fairly. But it's yeah, it's it's important to just keep an eye. Make sure you have an updated job description. If you mm -hmm. don't have it. Ask for it and just ensure that all your responsibilities are memorialized somewhere um, at all times. So maybe, you know, I tell you, Angela, I'm your manager and I don't have, you know, I, I just don't think you're ready at this point. Um, 
what would you say to that? <laughs> oh, well, um, I, the first question would be help me understand why. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the response, is it a leadership uh, behavioral um, concern or is it a technical skill concern? Mm -hmm. If it's a technical skill concern, um, how might I learn that technical skill? Technical mm -hmm. skills are much easier to learn, I believe, than what we call, you know, soft skills. Um, if it's a behavioral concern, excuse me, if it's a behavioral concern, then explain to me some examples so I can understand where I'm lacking or what your concerns are. And if this is the first time you're hearing these concerns, I think you as an individual should also be concerned <laughs> because <laughs> you haven't gotten this feedback up until this point. So that's also something to evaluate, you know, for your own efficacy, right? And your own development, your own career development as well. Um, I'm not a big pro proponent of like asking people, telling people to leave their companies, but mm -hmm. I'm a big, I have a big philosophy around, you know, employee empowerment and the fact that you deserve growth and development and to go, go to places where your talent is, is leveraged and utilized. Yeah, no, that that's good. Exactly. You know, the first response, if you get turned down uh, on your request for promotion should not be that, oh, my God, my manager doesn't care at all. I should leave the company. Uh -uh -uh. Like you have to essentially ask them for feedback, some real examples, the way that I'm asking examples of you, some real tangible examples of, OK, so tell me, share some real tactical examples of where I have um, shown in areas of improvement, where mm -hmm. I can grow. What are some ways I can grow if it's the technical skills, perhaps asking for investment in, in a course or in, in, you know, technical development, or perhaps um, they can put you in another, um, like a, a, as a shadow on, on yeah. another job or another mm -hmm. senior, senior person. Right. And so you can learn from that. And so keeping your uh, eyes and ears and heart open to receive feedback and then also asking and perhaps researching a little bit on the different ways you can get those skills and um, the soft skills development if you yourself are cognizant that those are some of the areas that you perhaps uh, would need to gain before you step into a promotion role, right? Yes, 100%. Absolutely okay. right. Very cool. So we are halfway done through the, the webinar and we're going to talk about for, for about 10 more minutes. But I want to remind everybody that if you have any questions, because some, some of us joined us a little bit late, if you have any questions, please start popping them in the ask a question box. Um, we will have plenty of time to take those questions for you. So, um, you know, sometimes it, it takes, us, takes us a little while to, to formulate those questions. So it's a, it's a good time to now start popping them in the ask a question box. All right. So I also wanted to ask you that there is research that suggests that 60% of all new managers fail on the, on the first job because they are just not trained to succeed. Right. And so what are some of the strategies that you suggest implementing for yourself when you're first starting to now transition from the individual contributor to a people manager role? Yeah. Um, so I would hope, you know, I, th I think the, the first piece is, you know, because I work a lot with organizations, right? I'm, I'm coming from the other side of things, which is it is worth investing in leadership development for your emerging and current leaders. So that is one thing if you are listening as a leader of an organization, I think that's one thing that we could all do better. Um, but personally for yourself, if you're in the position and let's say a leadership development program doesn't exist, or you know, you've got to find a scrappy way to get these skills, um, there's plenty of uh, really fantastic uh, leadership development programs. Pink Careers has one, for example, mm -hmm. that it would be a great um, experience for you to gather uh, leadership development skills and do that with a cohort of other um, people or other women who are also in the same boat. So you're getting not just the curriculum, but you're getting the mentorship. Um, you're getting, you know, I, I like to think about learning as 70, 20, 10, right? So 70% mm -hmm. of learning comes from experience. 20% mm -hmm. comes from social learning. Um, and then ten, only 10% 10 really comes from like actual like classroom training. So all three are important, but if you think about how can I maximize and, and accelerate my leadership development, it's really going to be through a program that has a really uh, well-versed way of, of creating learning around leadership. Uh, I think the other thing is, you know, there's some self-taught things that you can do. I mean, like 
Harvard, Cornell, all these places have leadership development programs, courses. Some of them are free that you could start to dig into and create a little bit of a lesson plan for yourself, attend webinars, attend expert panels like these, leader thought leaders around the topic, and do your own research as well. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some great points. And especially, I love HBR, like in particular, mm -hmm. uh, they have a, I, they have a podcast called HBR IdeaCast that I'm absolutely in love with. And then HBR has several other podcasts. There's one pertaining to uh, women and the particular problems that women face. And if so somebody's interested in that, they should definitely check that out. Mm -hmm. um, HBR Ascend has some great articles on young professionals. And so as you said, when you expose yourself to more of these conferences, these podcasts, uh, articles, or leadership development programs that allow you to just open your mind a little bit more and start mm -hmm. thinking about all of these different moving pieces that a manager has to uh, learn and take mm -hmm. care of, uh, which are a little bit step ahead from leader, right? <laughs> As we said, leader here and then people manager over here. So um, that, that, those are some great points. And really, um, or for organizations, I almost feel that this is like a chicken and egg problem mm -hmm. that sometimes organizations expect you to have the leadership skills already. But if you don't have them, then that becomes a reason for, for us to not be promoted. So then what are the different ways uh, for free? Or if you can, uh, if you have the means to, then working with the coach, how you can actually get those skills and accelerate your growth uh, in those in those areas. Um, so let's say I have done the things that I need to, mm -hmm. to get myself ready and succeed in the role of a manager. But for some reason, I still do not, you know, and then what do you think is considered a failure as a, as a, in, as a people manager? Maybe we start with that. And then if you do fail, then how do you regain your confidence from there? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I'm, I am a true believer that not everybody needs to be a people manager. Not everybody mm -hmm. has the will or the skill for leadership. And that's okay. Because mm -hmm. we need our technical experts, we need our professionals in place who are amazing at their job. What we what we forget is people leadership, people management re requires a skill set that's outside of you, it requires um, a selfless uh, skill set to say, I'm taking these voices, these people, these humans into consideration. And I need to actually adjust my style for each and every single person. If that sounds horrifying to you, or like, <laughs> I don't have time for that, then don't be a people leader. <laughs> it's okay. We, it's okay. We, we accept that. It's fair. Do, do not put yourself in a position where you're just taking a people leadership role or people management role because you want the title or the extra money because you're going to be miserable as an individual. Um, so I don't really see, I mean, failure would be creating, you know, hating your job and creating toxicity in other people's lives because you hate people leadership. That would be failure. Um, and only holding on to that for the title or the money or the status. Um, organizations also need to do a better job at creating paths mm -hmm. for Professional Technical leadership. Yeah. Technical leadership. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so rather than people leadership, find a way for you to be more of a thought leader, a technical leader in your area of expertise. Um, so I know I kind of like skirted around that question. So I don't believe there's any failure, but if we were going to talk about failure, it would be you staying in a role that makes you miserable. Yeah. <laughs> like I think that was, that was absolutely a trick question because there is really nothing called, called failure. Uh, exactly to your point, right? If you are staying put in a role which is making you miserable mm -hmm. and that is coming out on your team, that is failure. But other than that, there really nothing that so that was a trick question. But as you, as you rightly said, uh, not everybody has the skills um, or not everybody needs to be a people people manager. And there's plenty of ways to be a thought leader. There's plenty of ways to grow in technical leadership. And I want to remind everybody that when you start becoming more of a people manager, you start doing less of technical work. Yes. Okay. In yes. Um, PM, well, when I took the PMP exam, if I remember my stats right, it said 90% of the Job, like a, a manager's job is 90% of the time communicating. So you're just communicating, you're solving problems, you're connecting people, you're working with your stakeholders. And so if you're somebody who really hold technical uh, uh, technical work near and dear to your heart, think about ways in which you can become a thought leader and grow in technical leadership. And uh, 
I have to say that with the obviously uh, a little bit of empathy that not every organization has created paths yet to grow into um, to grow their technical leaders, but that's the work that you are doing, Angela, right? With organizations, so something something to keep in your minds as our audience when they uh, have an opportunity to bring you know uh, changes or opportunities for changes uh, to their HR leaders and to their business leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, another question that I have for you is how do you ask for support if you are struggling as a people uh, people manager and you want to get better at your role? How do you ask for that support? Yeah, I think uh, you mentioned Brene Brown earlier. Uh, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown and, and some of her teachings. And one of them is around vulnerability. And I think I, I think when people hear the word vulnerability, they think of like exposure and you know, being open for attack. But um, I, I, the definition that I use is just your ability to be open, right? Mm -hmm. And to admit mistakes and ask the questions and being able to receive uh, feedback or to receive someone else's perspective. So, you know, I think that being vulnerable and, you know, asking people about, uh, you know, their perspective on your leadership and also, Getting a mentor or a sponsor, I think, is mm -hmm. another one. You know, I think a lot of times people wait for a mentorship program, but who can you talk to who you look up to as an ideal leader, a transformative leader who has the skill set, has the behaviors that you're looking to adopt or to improve and asking that person if they would be willing to mentor you or coach you? Yeah. So as we wrap up our fireside chat and open up for questions. I want to remind everybody that you are the owner of your career. You have to be in the driver's seat of your career. So it is your responsibility to not wait for a mentoring program uh, or for your manager to pair you up with a mentor or a buddy. It is your responsibility to find that mentor um, or a sponsor. And if you have questions about how you can do that, go back to episode seven or eight, I, I, I want to say, in the Pink Careers webinars, then we have a whole episode on how you can find a mentor in your company or outside of your company. Mm. So as we wrap up our fireside chat and open up for questions, and again, reminding everybody, as you have, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the ask a question box here. Angela, how can people work with you if they would want to, and how can they find, a, find out more about the work that you're doing with individuals and organizations? Yeah, so um, AngelaRHoward.com is my website. And do you want to put something in the chat? And that would be great yeah. too. Yeah, I will do that. Um, so I mainly work on the um, organizational side. So I am helping organizations uh, do better, be better at culture change, career development, leadership development, uh, so that they can create a better environment for individuals like you all. Um, so if you all have, if you're working with an organization or um, you know, there's opportunities to introduce leadership development within intact teams within your organization. I would love to help and support uh, with that work. And then if you're an executive or a founder or an owner on the call, you know, my um, strategic work, my advisory work is really around helping you create change and transformation and actualize this, this thing called culture, right? Which is like this big buzzword that we're hearing, but how do you actually change behaviors and shift your organization to what you're aspiring to. Awesome. So let's start taking some questions. And so I have a question here from um, they ha the, the name doesn't come up. But the question is, how do you start a sponsorship program in a small company? Mm. Yeah, I that's a great question. I think, um, you know, a lot of people have different philosophies on this. And I would love to hear, um, you know, kind of your, your perspective, too. But sponsorship programs are really they're different than mentorship programs in that Sponsors are people who are actually making moves, taking action to get you in the right rooms and in the right places. So it's not just someone who's talking to you every month over coffee or lunch and giving you some feedback. It's actually someone who's saying, you know what, Angela needs to be in this room for this meeting because I really want her to present her strategy on X, Y, Z, or you really need to be connected with this person because they have a job opportunity. That's a sponsor. Mm -hmm. So. I think first step is understanding who is open to it. And that can be two people <laughs> to start, but who's open to it. And then um, talk to the individuals who would like to be sponsored. Um, you know, I would recommend um, 
some kind of structure where you're pairing these people, but you're providing more organic opportunities for the connections to happen. I think the organization and exec all executives should be sponsors, mm -hmm. regardless, even if you don't have a program. Every executive should be looking out for talent and saying, how can I create opportunity? How can I match these opportunities with the people? Um, so that's another piece is, even if you don't have a formal sponsor program, you really should be seeing your executive team as built-in sponsors. Very cool. Um, yeah, and I, I agree that sponsorship typically comes organically. So, yeah. um, and then it comes mainly through work, right? So if you've done work with your, with, uh, with the senior folks in your team, with the senior executives, um, like good work is the prereq for getting sponsorship. So that is something that we have to keep in mind. And then maintaining that connections once that, you know, once perhaps you've worked together on a project, uh, but maintaining that connection, you know, informally so that you are top of mind for that executive. And then for the executive to essentially have part of their job description, you know, succession planning. Like mm -hmm. they should always be thinking about succession planning that tomorrow I'm not, uh, you know, in the company for a variety of reasons, things should still be running. You know, business should be running without me. And so thinking about succession planning, I think is key, especially in smaller organizations where so much is dependent on people, right? Like people make an organization really. Yeah, the succession planning part is so important. Um, and it takes a lot of humility too, to say, <laughs> well, I am physically looking out for people who could potentially be my successor. That's, I mean, there's still a lot of people who have issues with that. You know, there's a little uh, bit of an ego there. It's like, well, I don't want anyone to take my job. Why would I start, you know, I'm early in my career. I've, I've just gotten the CEO role or the CFO role. Why am I looking for someone to replace me? But you should do starting that day one <laughs> once you're in that executive role. Yeah, I mean, succession planning and thinking about who who is that person who can take over my role is uh, leadership 101. I think that yes. is that's fundamental uh, to being a good leader. Mm -hmm. um, another question that we have that came through LinkedIn by Ashish Tolia is if someone has leadership skills in the early career and can be a good leader, if give, like, you know, so he's saying somebody may have good leadership skills in early career and can be a good leader if given the leadership role. However, these individuals are not performing up to mark um, as good technical team members as they were in the earlier career. Uh, shall that individual be considered for leadership roles? Also, how these individuals can make it to the level which they aim for or aspire for. So maybe mm -hmm. I butchered the question a little bit. So they're asking if someone has leadership skills in their early career and can be a good leader if given leadership roles. Um, however, these individuals are not performing up to mark good as technical team members in their early career or any role mm. that they're performing in early career. So I guess he's asking that if somebody is not a strong technical Mm -hmm. technical person, but they may have exhibited good leadership skills. Should these be still considered for leadership roles and how we can um, improve their performance? Mm. I think that's what yes. the question is asking. That's a great question. Uh, I think being clear about what leadership means at your company is is really important. So, um, you know, we talked about leadership today and the, you know what the research has told us about leadership but organizations need to also define what leadership means so mm -hmm. technically i think if somebody meets those qualifications of being a leader at your company mm -hmm. um, the technical skill set uh only really matters i guess if you're depend depending on the size of your team too right so if you have a team of one <laughs> You've got to be a player coach. The, the 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 percentage of player coach is going to be more on the technical side versus mm -hmm. if you have a team, team of 10. So those are also considerations. But I would argue that your best leaders are actually more generalists than technical mm -hmm. experts. Yeah, I think it completely depends on the on the role uh, mm -hmm. also. So if you, you know, again, it goes back to being like technical leaders where you may be good at people management as well. So you may be growing up in technical leadership, but also mm -hmm. being managing a team. And then uh, I, I would tend to agree with you that majority of leaders are actually generalists uh, or they tend to become generalists uh, once they step into into uh, people management roles. Excellent. Um, so if anybody else has other questions as well, feel free to pop them and ask a question box and then we will be happy to take them. I'm going to mark this one as done. And while you all are 
uh, typing in your questions. I would just, I wanted to take two seconds to talk about the next webinar that we have upcoming. And we've been, so every time we ask for feedback and I should do that here as well. So I'm gonna pop um, a feedback form in our chat because we love to collect feedback from everyone on the different topics that we are bringing you, if that added value to you and how we can improve these webinars. And one of the topics that had been very popular through these feedback was around office politics. So how do we navigate office politics? So that's the, the topic that we are bringing to you during our next webinar, which happens on 2nd of September, same time, 12 p.m. Eastern. And then on that uh, webinar, we are talking to Ms. Andrea Martin about office politics, how to play the game. <laughs> without it sounding dirty because you know, it is <laughs> yeah. not you have to play the game <laughs> yeah. uh, so with that um, I also want to remind everybody that I uh, love to have virtual coffee chats like we are having right now with Angela and having this fireside chat mm -hmm. uh, so on your screen you guys should see a button that says schedule virtual coffee so if any one of you is interested to have a chat with me or if you're interested to have a chat with Angela like she has put in her um, website address over there and you know mm -hmm. both of us would love to have virtual office with you yeah. uh, as we are doing right now and uh, with that we're gonna hang around for another two minutes and we are here if you have more questions this coffee is excellent i got this a new coffee um sent to me it has oh. a bold flavor and you know, it's all sorts of Italian roasts, so I'm kind of loving it. Ooh, yeah, I'm a big, uh, so I recently just got a new coffee maker with like, like to grind the beans and all of that. So I'm getting very the fancy, fancy with my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I'm now like a stickler for coffee, you know, it's, um, it's something, something new, <laughs> something new to get involved with while in, you know, this hybrid working world. So Absolutely. What, what does your cup say? Oh, this just has, so my brand strategist, she's a lovely person. Her name's Brittany. So after she did my website, she sent me a coffee mug with my logo on it. And it says the future of work is human. Oh, I love it. On my website too. So very cool. So with that, I just wanted to say a big thanks to Angela. Thank you for your time. And thank you for sharing yeah. such, um, such epiphanies with, with us, especially around why people manager is a much more difficult role than being a leader. And then also the 70, 20, 10 rule. And I wanted to also uh, say thanks to all our audience that have joined us again for this webinar, as well as anybody who joined us on LinkedIn Live. Thank you, everyone. And then we will see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Angela. Bye.